Okay. Hey folks. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to see everyone in the chat and let us know where you hail from and what security SBOM or GitOps problems you're trying to solve in the chat. Hopefully you're here today to hear from Dan, Pinky, uh, and Brady, who will be talking about security and the value of SBOMs. If you're brand new to our various Weave Works or GitOps talks or series, welcome. And if you've been coming to these for a while, welcome back. So a little bit of background, uh, if this is your first time coming to one of these events, uh, we've been running these for quite some time now, but the company that Pinky and I work for is called WeaveWorks. If you haven't heard of us, we are a startup with a globally distributed and remote workforce across the globe. A lot of what we do is based on open source. Uh, you might've heard of our projects, Flux and Flagger, which are in the CNCF as incubating projects. And we've recently submitted our application to graduate uh, Flux, was also the project that really kicked off the term GitOps. And it's really been cool to see a lot of adopters of the project and see the community grow over the last few years. So much so that large organizations like Microsoft, Amazon, web services, VMware, and others um, have adopted it and are using it under the hood to offer GitOps to their customers. Um, if you missed our one-stop shop event back in October of last year, you can find the playlist where all of those different cloud vendors kind of talk about um, what they've done with the Flux project and how they how they uh, integrated it into their offerings. Um, and coming up, we'll actually have uh, GitOps days where I think we'll talk a little bit more about that again in June. Um, so Cortex is another one of our projects that is in the CNCF that helps make uh, Prometheus scalable. I mentioned that because Prometheus is a, a key part of the progressive delivery possibilities with Flagger. Um, so that's one key option that you have there. And of course, other projects like Weave Ignite, EKS Cuddle, and now Weave GitOps, which is also a free open source tool um, that provides GitOps for your various uh, needs and has a UI on top of Flux. So we have many, many more. Uh, if you're interested, definitely check us out at GitHub under the Weave, under Weaveworks, as well as the CNCF where you can find our projects. And to learn more about us, you can always visit our website at weave.works. So a little bit of housekeeping before we get the presentation started. So we a lot about 30 to 60 minutes for any um, of these sessions. Today, we have a hard stop at the top of the hour, so we will have to cut it off then. Um, but the only thing I'll really mention here is that unless you have something really private to share in the chat, um, please change your to to everyone so that everyone in the audience can see your questions or comments. Sometimes our audience members answer each other's questions too. So make sure that you do that. Otherwise, I will be copying and pasting so everyone can see. Um, and just a quick note that I'll keep uh, track of all the questions um, in the chat and I can uh, throw them out to Dan, Brady, and Pinky uh, when applicable. So anytime you have a question, just put it in the chat and we'll get to it as we go along here. So some basics, if you're brand new, um, we just want to quickly cover what is GitOps, as the name indicates, it's Git plus Ops, uh, or sometimes we like to say operations by pull request, where you have a repo as your single source of truth. It's not just app dev or just operations, but really a methodology that crosses all areas. We talk about GitOpsing all the things, and the business value that comes with that are reliability, velocity, and security benefits. It's also a paradigm or like I said, a methodology. It's not one single tool or technology. Of course, we're very excited about our Flux project and we work really hard to get it to a place where we've already brought GitOps value, um, but we're really thinking about the vision of the most powerful way we can think about GitOps in the coming years and hopefully decades. Um, and we really feel that even if you're not using Kubernetes, you still can do GitOps. But if you are using Kubernetes, it's really uh, part of the evolution of Kubernetes, leveraging that API and what that brings. And we're really excited to be part of the community in a very deep way. Be sure to follow the work um, that the GitOps Working Group is doing under the CNCF App Delivery SIG, um, special, special Interest Group. Uh, their focus is to clearly define a vendor-neutral, principle-led meaning of GitOps and establish a foundation for interoperability between tools, conformance, and certification. You can find more uh, information on GitHub or at opengitops.dev. 
speaking of the GitOps working group, uh, these are the four principles of GitOps as defined by that working group. I'll run through these very quickly, uh, and I won't read them word for word, but uh, you can always check these out at, uh, at depth at the opengitops.dev website. So a key point I want to make here is that not everybody has all four principles. So really anywhere you start is a great way to get started on your GitOps journey. Whether you're using Git as your versioning system or not, the important thing is that you're using a versioning system. Um, other core principles are that you have a declarative system and that you have a way in which changes are automatically applied to that system. And then at the end, you have ways of reconciling, ensuring correctness, as well as alerting. Um, so that is a very quick overview of the GitOps principles. And like I said, if you're interested in learning more, you can find more information on opengitops.dev or at our website, uh, weave.works. So if you want to get connected to us in the Flux community, um, I will actually copy and paste some of these resources uh, in the chat so you can have, uh, you can link out to them. Um, but we, uh, we're all on um, Slack, the CNCF Slack. Uh, if you make your way over to GitHub, please be sure to give us a star there and check out the discussions. There's a great Q&A section there as well. Um, and yeah, if you uh, need an invite, I'll, I'll paste all these into the chat. So some upcoming events that we have. Um, Pinky today is actually going to be talking, um, giving you more of an uh, of an overview on what, what GitOps is and why you should care at the Open Source 101 uh, dot com conference happening next Tuesday. And then we'll have her and a couple of other folks that she used to work with back next week for a uh, an end user story on how they implemented GitOps. And then um, Scott Rigby, uh, who is a Flux and Helm maintainer, will be here for GitOps for Helm users uh, next Thursday as well. So um, we'll also have a Flux booth at KubeCon, and we hope to see you there. And we are just about to announce, so you're getting a little quick preview, uh, that we are uh, hosting GitOps Days 2022 on June 8th and 9th. So be sure to check that out. And with that, I'm actually done with my intro slides. So Dan, I will turn it off over to you if you wanna turn on your camera and your microphone and introduce yourself and take it away. Awesome, thank you, Stacey. Yeah. Hi, my name is Dan Luring. I'm the manager of open source engineering at Anchor. Uh, you can see various ways to reach out to me. If you have any questions uh, or just wanna talk to me either today or anytime after, um, definitely feel free to reach out to me. You can follow me on Twitter or just send me an email. Here's the, uh, the information for that. Cool. So um, we're going to talk about a few things today and kind of the interrelationship between uh, Flux and then this whole SBOM concept. But to kind of start with a, with a background, I want to talk about what an SBOM is. So this is a term you may have heard about recently. Um, it's becoming more and more popular, especially in the security space uh, of software. SBOM is an acronym that stands for Software Build of Materials. So what does that mean? That means it's taking a piece of software that you might have received, like a container image, or it could just be uh, some kind of executable. And it's describing uh, something about that executable or, or container image. And specifically, it's describing what is inside of it. So what is it made up of? And the analogy that's pretty popular, um, that I think is actually a pretty good one, is uh, likening it to a list of ingredients that you might see on a food label. So if you're buying some kind of food from the grocery store, um, like a, a candy bar or something like that, uh, it has to have a, a list of what's inside of it. What, what are the ingredients that went into that thing? Um, and this turns out to be pretty important, right? Because there might be something that's inside of this, uh, this food that I can't have. Maybe it has dairy or maybe it has peanut oil or who knows what it is, but it's, it's important that I can make an informed decision if I want to, um, that maybe this, this thing that I've received is not for me or, or needs to be treated with extra care. Um, so the exact same thing happens to apply to uh, software, no matter how you're consuming it, if you're getting some kind of bundle of archive package, like I said, container image, um, it's, it turns out it's pretty important to know what's inside of that software artifact. And so that's what an SBOM is. It, it lists out all the, the, the packages that, are, um, that, that comprise that software artifact um, so that you can make a decision about that and do something with that. So what might that something be that you do with it? There's a few different use cases um, for, for why you would use an SBOM um, or why you'd want to have an SBOM, maybe receiving it from someone who's shipping you software. The, the most practical use case for SBOMs right now is vulnerability scanning. Um, so this is the idea that you receive this list of all the software that comprises uh, a given artifact. Uh, maybe that's the uh, Debian packages that are included in your, your container image. 
Uh, maybe it's the uh, NPM packages that are part of your web app that you're shipping. Uh, it could be anything else, uh, any other language or, or OS ecosystem. And uh, you want to be able to look through those and, and kind of cross correlate that with vulnerability data to see which of those uh, pieces have known vulnerabilities reported about them. And then you can take action based on that. Maybe maybe one, one of the packages you're receiving has a super critical vulnerability. And so you just can't launch this into your production system because you can't have uh, your software be vulnerable um, you know, for a potential attack. Um, but there's other use cases for SBOMs as well. So um, we, we talk about a few others like software transparency, just the fact that you can uh, you can trust what's inside of, of the software ends up being pretty important um, for you to reason about it and just to learn about it. Um, there might be uh, uh, various inspections that you want to do downstream and so it's important to just start by capturing it, um, this, this data, and then you can uh, you can feed that into other processes downstream of that uh, when you're ready to. Um, and the other thing is policy. So you can certainly have policy that's based on vulnerability scan results. So if you take an SBOM and then you do a vulnerability scan on that SBOM, now you have a vulnerability scan result. You might have policy that's based on that the, the vulnerability scan, such as I can't have any vulnerabilities that are at medium severity or higher. That's an example of policy. You can make a decision not to allow, for example, a container image into your cluster. But there's other kinds of policy you might want to do that's outside of vulnerability. So you, for example, you might have uh, a particular publisher that you don't allow any software from, or you might have, um, you might want to look at license information for the packages that you have and see, um, I, I don't allow a particular license or something has to be a certain license. Um, there can be other kinds of information in SBOMs, like what are the digests of the files and are those what I expect? So um, all sorts of things you can do with an SBOM once you have it. And we'll look at SBOMs up close in a little bit, but I just wanted to kind of give a, uh, a brief sense of what an SBOM is and why folks are kind of talking about it more nowadays. All right, so what is Anchor, what is Sift, and what is Gripe? I'll, I'll uh, briefly go over these. So um, Anchor is the company I work for. And so this is a startup that was founded in 2016, um, really focused uh, at that point on container security. And so um, it's really cool how Anchor has kind of evolved over, over the years because uh, at first, uh, this, this, this focus on container security and the particular approach was all about figuring out what the composition of something was. And so we were looking at container images and doing these deep inspections about um, all the layers of the image and what comprises those, those layers. What's on the file system? What are all the files? What are their digests? Um, what, are, you know, what are the software and, and what are various data sources for vulnerability information that we might want to consult as we're reasoning about this container image? And so now that um, uh, supply chain security is on the rise, Anchor is kind of perfectly positioned for this new world where it's all about tracking all of the assets that are flowing from your dependencies into your software and then into all of your consumers. Um, this is the kind of uh, uh, data that Anchor knows how to reason about at this point pretty well. Um, and so there's, uh, there's an enterprise offering that, that's, that uh, is, is pretty amazing. If you're interested in learning more, definitely follow up with me. But I'll also say I'm here to talk about the open source. So everything we're going to show today is uh, Anchor's open source side, which is the, the side that I run uh, totally free and uh, free to check out. And so our two flagship command line tools right now are these two called uh, Sift and Gripe. And you can see their cute little logos here. So um, Sift is the SBOM generator. So this takes, uh, you point Sift at some kind of artifact um, that can be uh, a file, it can be some kind of archive like a tar.gz, it can be a Go executable, it can be a container image. Um, and so Sift uh, basically tell, creates an SBOM that reflects that artifact. And so um, there's multiple SBOM formats, we'll talk about that, but it's basically gonna spit out a list of all the software that com that's uh, composing uh, that artifact that you pointed out. But it doesn't tell you anything about vulnerabilities. So for that, we have Gripe. Gripe uh, is a really cool uh, kind of modern take on how to do vulnerability scans right from the command line. And so you can take Gripe and point it at, again, one of those same artifacts, and it'll tell you all the vulnerabilities that it detects um, based on known vulnerability um, information that's been published. It'll tell you where you're vulnerable with your specific artifact that you have. Um, and so there's integrations for both of these and like GitHub Actions and stuff like that. Um, but the other cool thing that Gripe can do is uh, it can scan the output of SIFT. So if SIFT is outputting SBOMs, uh, you can take SBOMs as an input to a vulnerability scan. And we'll talk about whether that's a good idea and why you would want to do that a little bit later. So. All right, I'm going to hand it briefly back to Pinky at Weaverx because this is kind of where the story begins of the intertwining between this SBOM stuff that we're talking about and Flux, which is why you're all here. Hey, sorry. Um, okay, so 
Sorry, my computer. Okay, so basically, um, as many of you know, uh, Flux was actually donated by WeBWorks to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation CNCF as a sandbox project in July of 2019. Within the CNCF projects, um, there's maturity levels, which signals basically what sorts of enterprises should be adopting them. Um, so actually a year after entering CNCF in July of 2020, Flux was one of only two projects in the adopt category of the CNCF continuous delivery tech radar alongside Helm. And then Flux then went from sandbox to incubation in March, 2021. And in November of 2021, Flux underwent a security audit in preparation for our application to graduate, which is the highest maturity level within the CNCF. Um, so basically, the security audit sparked an internal review of our overall practices, and supply chain became an important point for us to improve on and provide better capabilities to our users. We were looking to generate SBOMs for all our projects, provide ways for users to verify the integrity of our artifacts, and also secure those artifacts against tampering. The criteria was to use tools that were focused on the open source software ways of working, which quickly led to SIFT for SBOM generation with the benefit of Gripe um, for vulnerability scanning and Cosign for images and artifacts um, signing. Both tools are integrated in Go Releaser, which Flux2 uses for its release pro process. Um, being able to enable both features leveraging the same tooling we had in place for two years was, uh, with just a few settings, made the decision and adoption quite easy. And then um, in, in March, like Stacy mentioned, we actually applied for graduation. So it's exciting. And I'll pass it back over to Dan. Awesome, yeah. Um, and we're so glad that you did choose SIFT because that brought us all together. Um, so uh, I wanna look a little bit at to how exactly Flux is using SIFT um, to show how hard of a, of a lift that was to get that implemented. Um, and then I'm actually gonna to take over the screen and demo um, some of how you can get started with these tools and, and kind of show you um, kind of more concretely what an SBOM is and what kind of information is stored and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so you can see here on the screen uh, just a little bit, uh, it turns out that Flux is a, is a Go project and there's a really cool tool in Go called Go Releaser. And Go Releaser is a release automation tool. And so the idea is that if you have a Go project and you want to figure out how to start releasing it to folks so that they can use it um, via, uh, you know, uh, Helm deployment all the way to just like a single binary that they're running on their on their developer machine. Um, Go Releaser has kind of thought of all the possible things pretty much that you would ever want to do with a, a release for a Go project. Um, and then provided these really nice integrations um, to where it just has all these things you can either turn on or turn off. So for example, those things might be, uh, I want to cross compile for all of these different platforms, you know, Mac, Linux, Windows, plus these other special architectures. Um, maybe I want to also uh, do something about like to post to a GitHub release and post these assets to GitHub. Maybe I also want to send out a Slack notification or a tweet about it. Um, maybe I also want to create and publish container images that, that, that have my software installed in it already. Um, so there's all sorts of things you can do with Go Releaser. And so what this is highlighting in this red rectangle on the right side, this is what they had to add in order to get SIFT uh, to be generating SBOMs and for SBOMs to be um, provided to their users alongside every Flux release that they ship automatically. So as you can see, it's just a few lines of YAML. Um, it's pretty cool. And, and even this has a little bit of extra customization in it for the file name. Um, so yeah, this is a, an integration between SIFT and Go Releaser that happened uh, I think as recently as winter of, of last year. So, um, or so like December-ish, I think, maybe November. Um, so it's pretty recent, but it's just super easy to add SBOMs. And so now we're, we're just seeing tons of projects that already use Go Releaser that are becoming wise to the fact that they should probably be reporting transparently about the software within them. And so we're seeing uh, this integration show up all across GitHub at this point. Um, it's pretty cool to see. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, great. So. Um, the other thing that that uh, is is a note about how Go Releaser works is that the integrations with Go Releaser, when they're invoking other tools, they do it through these binaries as opposed to like incorporating the, all these um, uh, these projects as like Go libraries that just import and and then make Go bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, sorry, Go Releaser bigger and bigger. And so uh, the only thing about that is you also have to install SIFT ahead of time. Um, so I just wanted to call that out. And that is again shown in the rectangle on the right. And it is also two lines because there's a, if you're using GitHub Actions at least, uh, there's already a, uh, a nice snippet that will automatically have uh, SIFT installed for you. 
Um, and if you're not using GitHub Actions, there's also uh, a couple of lines you can run to get it uh, installed natively for wherever you're running. Um, so let's go to the suite. Okay. Um, and then this is just kind of showing it all together. This is uh, the Go releaser process running, you know, which which does uh, the SIFT SBOM generation as part of it, alongside everything else that, that Flux already had. Um, and so we're actually going to look at this file in a second uh, live, but this is just kind of showing you um, what, what's involved uh, kind of end to end with this release process. So they had a pre-existing release workflow that's, that was fully automated via this release YAML file. And so now you kind of have seen the totality of what Flux had to add in order to check that box of having uh, SBOM be published alongside every Flux release. So it's pretty cool. All right, and now we're gonna get our hands dirty a little bit. So I'm gonna um, take over the screen here and show you all uh, up close, what is SIFT, what is Gripe, and then how does how do I do this this Go releaser thing that Flux happened to do? Um, so let's take a look at that here. Let me pull up my terminal, share my screen, and then I'll try to pay attention to the uh, chat as well. Um, definitely, I'm the kind of person who does not mind being uh, interrupted if you have questions. Yeah, I just wanted to um, that we had a couple that were already in the chat, so uh, you might be addressing these during your your demo, um, yeah. but let's get them out of the way now before you jump in. So um, Winnie says, my learning expectations, how best can I use Flux V2 with SBOM tools learning tutorials? So that's more just a comment. Um, and then another question here is, is there a tool that will generate the SBOM automatically from the Docker image or should I create the SBOM myself? That's a great question. That is a great tee up for what I'll be showing. I really appreciate that. Um, and so the short answer is we're going to use uh, SIFT and we're going to see what SIFT gives us uh, in terms of an SBOM for a Docker image. We can look at that. Um, great question, though. All right, let me share my screen here. All right, uh, so hopefully you see a, a giant terminal. Um, we're going to look at a few things. So uh, first, let's just take a look at, at SIFT and Gripe really quick. So um, if you're not familiar, uh, I uh, we can include links to this, but uh, SIFT and Gripe are both open source projects that are hosted on GitHub, github.com uh, slash anchor slash SIFT or slash Gripe. Um, and so you can check it out. Uh, the readme kind of tells you all about uh, what's going on uh, with this tool. What does it do? What uh, ecosystems does it support? How do I install it? Um, what are some of the more advanced features if I'm interested in that? All the various output options, et cetera. Um, and then same thing for Gripe. And so I've already installed these tools. And so we're going to kind of show you what they look like when you're actually running them. Um, so SIFT, I'll just type SIFT by itself, um, shows you the help. And so it kind of shows you, uh, gives you a feel of all the things you can uh, point SIFT at to generate that software bill of materials. And so um, like, uh, like Flux is doing, you can point it at uh, a binary. You can point it at a, a binary that's been packaged up in a distributable archive, like a TAR file or a gzip TAR file. Um, you can also point it to uh, a, an image that's, uh, that you maybe built locally with Docker and it's, it's sitting in your local Docker engine. Um, it can fetch images from OCI registries remotely. It can talk to Podman. It can look at images that have been saved out ahead of time to disk. And so these, these container images are represented in some kind of uh, either OCI format or maybe a proprietary format um, as tar files. Um, SIFT can also just look at local, local directories. Like if you've checked out a repo from, from GitHub or something, and you have a you know a package lock JSON or something like that, and you want to understand uh, what software is being described, but kind of in this standard format that can then feed into this nice workflow with vulnerability scanning and all that. Um, SIFT can just look at local files on disk uh, or in, in local folders. So um, lots of things you can point SIFT at. And so one thing that you can do, uh, I'll do this. Uh, um, I'm going to just point SIFT uh, to, to scan itself. So SIFT, and then I'm going to give it the path. This will expand out to. Um, the, the path that I have SIFT installed locally. And so here you can see all of the packages that make up SIFT. So like most code, um, like most applications, there's the actual application code that the app team has developed. And then there's all the dependencies that they're bringing in um, as part of developing that software. And so that's what SBOM is really all about is showing you all of that software that you may not have realized was also coming along for the ride um, with the tool that you received. So for example, this is how you could uh, have SIFT report on itself in terms of what software is currently bundled in this exact binary um, uh, that comes with SIFT. Um, we can also, someone asked about Docker images, so I can, we can do uh, uh, container images too, like we can do a bunch of latest, for example. Cool. Um, 
So uh, this is showing you a list of, of what, what you're getting. So for example, if, you're, if your application is, is building a Docker image uh, that's based on Ubuntu latest, and so maybe your, your Docker file has like from Ubuntu latest, and then you're doing some more commands on top of that, that's especially why SIFT is really useful and why this, this SBOM concept is really useful because you kind of get to see all of that. Um, people who are using your container image might kind of have some guess about what the application brings along with it. Like if it's a if it's a node app, it might be aware of um, the node packages because those are nicely defined and package JSON or something like that. But um, a lot of people don't realize how a lot of other things are coming along when you're shipping that software via container images, if you're using a base image that has all this software installed already. So if your from line says Ubuntu latest, even if you're just installing a few things for your application, you're also shipping all of these other uh, software packages, uh, whether you realize it or not. And so again, SIFT is all about transparency and just surfacing what it can find uh, to help people understand and even, even help the app team itself understand what's coming along. And maybe you can also think about, do I need all of these things? Am I shipping uh, more than I need to? Is my risk exposure larger than it needs to be? Um, or do I, or are there opportunities to simplify? Um, the other thing that's uh, interesting about SIFT is it, is it actually finds a whole lot more than it's showing right here. And so this is our, our default output. This is like our table view, just shows a summary, what the package name is, what version it's on, uh, and what kind of ecosystem it's coming from. So in this case, Debian or D package. But uh, if I run the exact same command, uh, I can do this uh, output option dash o JSON, and I'll uh, pipe it to a, a pager here. Uh, so this is actually what Sift knew about that container image upon scanning it. Um, and so you kind of get the full details with this view. This is a this is not a standard format. This is the this is the uh, Sift like Sift's own format, just exactly what it found. Um, but you can see here that when it finds these artifacts, it actually finds a lot of information about any given artifact that it finds. And so this may be important to you, depending on what you're doing with this data. Um, so here we can see again the same bits of data that were shown before. We can see the name, the version, the type. Um, and then some internal information. We can see exactly what files uh, within the image led SIFT to conclude that this package is present. And so for a D package, that's often um, the usual suspects. It's the varlib dpackage status file. SIFT is also, and this is true for grep too, they're container image aware. So they understand that there's not just necessarily a flattened view um, like you would see at a container at runtime, but that container images can be comprised of multiple layers. Um, and so it can show you the layer ID that it found this, this file on. Um, so that's pretty cool too. Um, it can tell you license information that it detected, language if there is one, but these are, these are OS distro packages. Um, different kinds of identifications that can be useful for different kinds of workflows like CPEs and package URLs. Um, and then even on an ecosystem specific basis, it can tell you even more information that it found. So um, it can tell you who the maintainer is. It can tell you the files that are claimed uh, by this package in terms of that, um, that D package status record. Um, so there's all sorts of information that is, that's shown here. Um, so I'll get out of that. Uh, the other thing to just note before we move on to gripe is that uh, there are standard SBOM formats that are worth knowing about if you're starting to get familiar uh, with SBOMs and wanna, wanna use them in real workflows. Um, so there's, uh, there's, a, there's two main standards that are out right now. One's called Cyclone DX and one's called SPDX. Um, and those both have really great websites that explain uh, kind of what their mission is and what they're trying to do with their format. Uh, and the other thing to note is that even within those different specs, uh, there are uh, various file formats that are supported. So for example, um, SPDX uh, has, I think, at least five or so different output formats uh, that it supports. CIF, of those, SIF supports the most popular, which are, um, there's a format called tag value, which I can show you here really quick, um, where you basically have a bunch of key value pairs separated by uh, these like package delimiters here. There's also a, a JSON version of this that SPDX supports as first class. And then on the Cyclone DX side, again, there's multiple formats that it supports within Cyclone DX, so still considered Cyclone DX, uh, but the data is just packaged up for various uh, you know, file formats, basically. So they have an XML uh, version that's, that's pretty popular, and they also have JSON too. So um, especially if you've heard of these formats or wondering, you know, a lot of people ask which one's better. And um, uh, I think it really depends on your use case and a great, uh, 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 approach that I've been uh, using recently to just kind of build my intuition about the difference is to kind of put them in like terms with SIFT. So SIFT can uh, look at uh, uh, the JSON for both, for example, just to make them in, in somewhat like terms. And then you can kind of see uh, 
like you can kind of compare side by side. Okay, here's the kind of data being captured by SPDX and in what shape the data is represented. And the same thing for Cyclone DX and you can contrast as much as you want there. Um, okay, and I see a question here. Does SIF generate SBOM for Java applications jar um, added to the Docker image during the build? Uh, so the, the short answer is yes. There's a couple edge cases uh, that I I'm not sure if we catch, if things are super deeply embedded. Um, but, uh, but in general, yes, like there's, there's actually a, a study that came out, I think just after log4j, uh, happened, uh, log4j's, uh, log for shell vulnerability came out in December that compared, uh, sift and gripe to a bunch of other scanners. And so, uh, the short answer is that at this point, sift and gripe, uh, I think are, I think they're, they're the best in terms of what the study found in, in various ways that jars can be packaged up within container images, within other jars, within some of the less common, uh, Java formats. Um, uh, within tars, you know, that, like, you know, nested in several jars deep within like a jar within a jar within a jar. Um, SIFT looks at jars recursively um, until it's done finding what's there. So there's a lot that can be surfaced uh, with the Java ecosystem by SIFT. Does Docker have to be installed? That's a great question. Um, so sorry, does Docker have to be installed or running uh, to make the command that I just ran with SIFT Ubuntu latest work? Um, the answer is no, Docker does not have to be installed. Um, there's there's a few different ways that SIFT can work. And again, everything I'm saying about SIFT applies to Gripe too. Gripe actually uses SIFT under the hood for its deep analysis. Um, and so uh, the way it works is that if you do have Docker running and or, or something that's pretending to be Docker, like a uh, rancher or something, um, it will talk to the, the local Docker daemon um, or wherever you're hosting Docker and ask it to, uh, for the image in question. And this is really useful if you do have a very Docker-centric workflow where you're, maybe you're building images locally, um, so they only reside locally, they're not found in any remote registry, and you want to scan that image. So for that to, for that to happen, uh, Docker does need to be running, only because Docker will be the only one to know about that image's existence. Um, but if you don't have Docker installed or, or any of those kind of local uh, container runtimes installed, uh, also SIFT will work just fine, because what it does then is it reaches out to the registry uh, directly, um, canonically. So for eventually latest, it would find it on Docker Hub, for example. Um, and uh, it'll just fetch the image on the fly and do the same, same exact analysis uh, using uh, the image it receives from the registry. Um, and SIFT also has something that's kind of cool. If you, if you do have Docker, or maybe you have kind of a unique setup, but you still want SIFT to pull from a certain place, even though there's other options that it, you might think it could pull from, um, SIFT has this notion of, of schemes. So you can actually specify, like even if I'm running Docker locally, um, I can type in this, I can prefix it with registry. There's, there's, a, there's a very small number of these scheme prefixes and those show up in the SIFT help. Um, but I can do, then I can like type my regular query. And so that forces SIFT to use the registry, um, even if the image is available locally or might be filtered through the local Docker Im uh, image. This will make sure it goes to the registry directly. And the same thing can be done in the other direction to Docker or something. All right. Um, okay, we've been talking a lot about SIFT. And then just to show you, uh, Gripe can do the same thing. Uh, but the output of Gripe is not in terms of all packages that are found. It's only in terms of matches between packages and vulnerabilities. And so Gripe is aware of the uh, latest vulnerability data from several of the big vulnerability sources, um, vulnerability data sources. And so it's taking that data and then kind of uh, cross comparing it with the packages that it found. Uh, again, under the hood, it's using SIFT. Um, and so it knows all the packages that are there. And so for each package, it determines if there's any records in any of the vulnerability databases that apply to that package. And so um, when I say apply, I mean, that would mean it's describing, in fact, that package and not just the same name package from somewhere else. And also uh, a big part of vulnerability matching has to do with versions. So um, if there's a piece of software that's been vulnerable, but then it was just patched, um, it matters if the software that's in your container image or any other thing that SIFT can scan um, is at that patched version or is it not quite at that patched version so it's still vulnerable. And so Gripe knows how to do all that and, and just filter out um, things that, are, that don't apply and just show you what, what does apply. Um, and then I'll also point out that Gripe has the same kind of deeper knowledge than it lets on at first. So if you're really interested in doing vulnerability scanning and just basic security assessment um, of any kind, um, there's this view which kind of gives you a, a nice overview of what's happened uh, with the vulnerability assessment. But similar to SIF, there's different output options for Gripe. And so <clears throat> you can do uh, dash O JSON is that kind of lossless output that shows you everything that Gripe knew. So I can rerun this scan. Um, uh, I'll do the same scan with dash O JSON. And so we'll show you that everything that um, Gripe was aware of. And so here you see this uh, matches array. And so for each match, it shows you the vulnerability 
um, the identifier where you can find more information for the upstream original vulnerability data source, um, the current fix status, like this is known not to be fixed yet. Um, it can show you related vulnerabilities if it, if it is aware of like maybe a vulnerability coming from both NVD, the National Vulnerability Database, and a proprietary um, OS distro feed, but they refer to the same underlying vulnerability. Greg can show you both of those. Um, it can show you various uh, impact assessments like CVSS scores. And it also, I'll skip down here. Notice it also shows you a lot of the same information that SIF shows you so that Gripe has like the best ability to do vulnerability matching um, accurately. Um, and then there's this kind of middle section for each match that I think is pretty cool and definitely helps us out as the Gripe maintainers. This is kind of Gripe showing its work. So um, a big deal uh, with vulnerability matching is just how messy the data is on both sides. So there's the package data that's, that's published is not always pristine or the most accurate. Um, and then there's uh, vulnerability data, which can be uh, in some cases submitted by anyone. Uh, and so you get a mix in quality of both data sources. And so it's Gripe's job to kind of deal with that and, and find the best matches that it can. And it doesn't always get it right. And no vulnerability scanner does get it right all the time. Um, but it tries to do as good a job as it can. And on top of that, it shows how it concluded the, that something was a match. And so it'll show you the exact, uh, the, you kind of have to get into Gripe to understand this a little bit, but um, at a high level, it kind of shows you which vulnerability namespace is it looking within? Um, what, what were the actual criteria that it used in terms of the data query to find the vulnerability match? Um, and so you can, you can glean from this that maybe Gripe was going about this, this package data the wrong way, or maybe it actually was doing it the right way, but there's some underlying problem with the way the data, the data from the package was surfaced. Anyway, um, really, really cool information that you can, you can see here if you're getting into this uh, more seriously. All right. And the last thing I want to show um, before we get back to Go Releaser and Flux is um, the connection between the two. So SIFT and Gripe exist together for a reason. Um, and there's a few connections between the two that are worth pointing out here. One is that Gripe uses SIFT under the hood. These are both written in Go. And so a technical detail is that SIFT uh, is also uh, a library in addition to being a, an executable binary. And so um, when, you're, when you're telling Gripe to do a vulnerability scan for a container image like Ubuntu Latest or, or anything else, um, uh, what it's actually doing is using SIFT on the fly uh, behind the scenes to create an SBOM, and it doesn't expose the SBOM directly, although you did see all that package information in Gripe's output, but it doesn't actually generate the SBOM that it saves anywhere. Um, it's using it uh, just in memory so that it can do a really accurate vulnerability scan. Um, and so uh, one of the really cool things about Gripe and, and its pairing with SIFT is that instead of pointing Gripe at a, a software artifact directly, you can actually point Gripe at an SBOM, like literally just to the SBOM. Um, and you can even just take SIFT, SIFT's output and pipe that into Gripe on the command line and Gripe will know what to do with it. Um, and so this is a really, really powerful workflow, it turns out. Um, a lot of people ask if I'm scanning an SBOM instead of the original artifact, is that as good or is that kind of not quite as good? There's some, some data loss or fidelity loss because I'm uh, looking at an analysis, not the, not the raw original thing. And the truth is that uh, if you're scanning an SBOM, uh, if it's a high quality SBOM, uh, it can be just as, just as uh, accurate a vulnerability scan as if it scanned the original artifact. Um, which is pretty cool. And in fact, you even have a chance to get a better than uh, original scan because seeing that uh, seeing the SBOM exposed as, as an explicit step and something that is uh, observable and even editable gives you a chance to provide even better information um, than maybe was first observed when the SBOM was produced and then give Gripe the best chance of matching uh, something accurately. So a good example of that is um, maybe, maybe um, uh, uh, so Go is a really interesting example because Go is actually including this package information as metadata within the binary. So it's really transparent about what's going into it. Not all binaries are like that, of course. So there could be a project that's written in C or something that is just a binary. There's not a lot of great things you can glean from that, um, even with the best static analysis tools. And you might be wondering uh, what is in this. And so this is a chance where if, if uh, you come across this um, and you produce an SBOM, you can actually uh, alter the SBOM if you want to, to supplement information. Or maybe you also generated an SBOM ahead of time where you did have access to better information and you wanna merge these SBOMs into one that kind of has a view of before this compilation process and after. Um, and there's some cool things you can do with that to really give, uh, you actually make a lot better uh, vulnerability scan results based on the SBOM. So SBOMs are really cool um, tools with this workflow. And the other thing you can do that's great is you can take uh, you can take an SBOM of a container image uh, if, if you're doing a container image workflow, 
uh, you can do it just one time because container images uh, are addressable by digest and so they never change once they're formed. Um, and so you can forever associate an SBOM with that container image digest. And then you can recurringly scan for vulnerabilities because vulnerability information is coming out all the time. Um, but you can just keep using that SBOM and avoid the needing for the full scan of the image or pulling of the image to a different environment if you don't want to allow that. Um, you can just use the SBOM. So there's some, there's some really neat uh, workflows you can do with that. All right, um, so that's sifting gripe. Uh, let's talk about Flux and let's talk about how Flux is using um, uh, SIFT to generate the SBOMs. So I mentioned that Flux is using a tool called Grow Releaser. So I wanna kind of show what that would be like if you wanted to do what Flux did um, on your own project and, and particularly if you have a Go project for the sake of this example. Um, so let's look at this. So I'm in this demo uh, directory and I just have uh, a couple files. Um, a very simple Go project, um, not my not my best work, I'll say. Um, really, really simple program that just outputs to the terminal, I love SBOMs, which is absolutely true. Um, so I can actually run this program. And uh, sure enough, it says I love SBOMs. That's great. Um, so I can, uh, I don't have Go Releaser uh, up and running with this project yet. But so let's say I wanted to do that. I've went ahead and installed Go Releaser, and uh, I'll just go ahead and, and mention this. Um, Go Releaser has a really fantastic website, uh, goreleaser.com, that shows you all of those little things you can do in terms of uh, customization uh, for your release pipelines by just adding a few lines of code. In fact, this is all we're going to add for um, when, we, when we go to add SBOMs. It's pretty neat. Um, back to the terminal. So I'm going to go ahead and type this command. Uh, actually, Go Releaser has a config that it uh, drives everything off of. And so if you don't have a config to start with, you can just type Go Releaser init. And then bam, you, you now have a, uh, a goreleaser.yaml file that you can uh, define everything you want to for goreleaser. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do that. So I'll just uh, edit that file. So uh, this is what the goreleaser yaml looks like. There's different sections that it can include. We can, we can clean a little bit of this up um, just because we're going to do a super simplified view. Um, we'll give it a project name. We'll just call it demo. Uh, we can leave the rest, that's fine. And so I haven't added anything about SBOMs yet, but I just wanted to show you what Go Releaser does just so you have a, a sense of it. Um, Go Releaser, like I said, can be doing a, a lot of publishing on your behalf to, uh, to GitHub, to Homebrew, to um, all sorts of other um, you know, container registries and all that. But we're gonna do a, a kind of a local only uh, view just for this um, to keep it simple. So um, once I have this uh, configuration file set up, I can do Go Releaser. Uh, and we're just going to do a snapshot and that'll basically produce all of the artifacts, but it won't push them anywhere. And so that's a great way to kind of refine what I want to be producing before I actually am making this available to the whole world. So I just did that command and you can see it goes off and does a whole bunch of different things. And this is pretty cool. So I just had my one uh, bit of source code and all of a sudden I have uh, produced all of these different versions of my application packaged up, ready to go for all of these different operating systems. And in fact, I can kind of visualize what was produced by just looking at my file tree here. And I see it created this dist folder, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it, and it created a, a version of my demo app for all of these different platforms for Darwin, so Mac OS, um, Linux and Windows. And then even among those, there's different processor architectures. It also put all those into uh, distributable archives, tart.gz, uh, created checksums for all the artifacts, um, put it here. So that's pretty great. Um, and in fact, if I wanted to, I could take, uh, let's say I'm running on uh, Darwin AMD64, so I could try to find dist uh, demo Darwin, you know, AMD64 and actually find the binary and run it, and it should do the same thing. So that's pretty great. I have all these binaries now. We're going to do that again, though. We're going to uh, kill all that stuff, and we're going to add, we're going to edit the uh, Go Releaser file, and we're just going to add one little section. Uh, I think it was SBOMs, artifacts, archive. All right, great. So that's all I added. And I'm going to run the exact same command again and see what it does. Oops, I forgot one punctuation mark. I knew I would do this. There is a dash in front of this. All right, take two. There we go. So you can see it did the same uh, actions it did before, but in addition to that, it created uh, these SBOMs and it says cataloging artifacts. And so um, if I look at the same kind of tree view as before, um, I see that alongside every artifact that I would ship to someone or, or include on GitHub, 
I also have an SBOM that corresponds to exactly that um, archive. And so it, it's actually going ahead and independently cataloging just to make sure it really knows the right answer um, for all the software in here and here and here, et cetera, and describing it in these SBOMs. And so um, that's really all you have to do once you have Go Releaser and you want to add um, SBOMs to your flow. If you're not using Go Releaser, there's also a lot of uh, uh, easy options for integrating SIFT. You saw how simple the SIFT commands are, um, and you can you can specify different output formats. The last thing I want to do though before we wrap up is actually show you uh, the end state, which is actually Flux. Uh, you know, now that Flux did this work, they are shipping SBOMs alongside all the Flux releases, which is really great because now Flux's users. Uh, have better transparency and visibility into what software they're receiving when they receive Flux. And so you can look at uh, Flux's uh, releases page. And so you can see this is the latest release. Actually, this, this is great. This just came out 10 hours ago. I see that the release has some, some changes and it has all these assets that come with the release. And this is really a best practice when you're creating SBOMs for your project. And so uh, Flux is following the best practice, which is to um, distribute the SBOMs alongside wherever you're distributing your actual software itself. So you don't want to be finding these two things in separate places. You want to be finding them right alongside each other. Um, that gives users the best chance of finding it and being able to use it for the kind of security benefits they want, depending on their workflow. And so here I can look at this. I see we have an, uh, an SBOM right here um, that's just included automatically for Flux. And I'm going to grab this link and I will uh, uh, go ahead and, and grab that. And then we can actually uh, look at this uh, file here. Oops, that was the other one. Yeah. So uh, for example, the Flux release is using the SPDX format that we mentioned, it's using the JSON variant. So you can now see using this file, all the software that's bundled up into Flux. So you can see there's a package called uh, cloud.google.com slash go. Um, you can see information about that package. You can see information about the next package. Um, there's one called go storage, et cetera. And so you can see all the things that are coming with Flux as dependencies so that you can make decisions about that for yourself. All right, I think that's all I had. Um, any other questions? I don't see any in the chat right now, but um, I did have a question about um, like gripes output and vulnerability remediation. Like, sure. is there is there any sort of uh, of data that you guys include for remediation of vulnerabilities? Or do you kind of leave that up to people to do their own research? Yeah, um, it depends. So so um, uh, so the answer is kind of. Uh, gripe, gripe pulls information from um, a number of different vulnerability data sources. And so some data sources have what the fixed version is, and it's it's authoritative. So it, it's coming from the producer of that software. They said, we patched this as of version 5.0.1. Um, some data sources don't have that information, or they might have a soft indication of it. Like, you know, we know that this range is affected, but we can't speak to anything after that. And so Gripe handles those two cases differently. And so in the case where it does know positively there is a fixed version reported, it can provide that information. And so, um, Gripe can be used and is used in some workflows um, within a remediation workflow. And in fact, the, the Anchor Enterprise product has these remediation workflows, of course, um, if you're interested. Um, what Gripe's job is to just surface the information to begin with. And so this is kind of the philosophy at Anchor in terms of the open source is sifting Gripe are really about exposing the truth and then acting on the truth to like then have a direct, like to basically modify your software itself. That's kind of the next step, but, but you're able to do that better now that you have this information. So. Um, what you can do with what you can see with Gripe's output is that if you upgraded to this version, you'd be fixed. But Gripe doesn't upgrade the version for you. Um, sure. But you 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 would, you could see how that would um, be a natural next step, and how you do that depends on your exact uh, setup. But uh, yeah, cool. good question. Right Great. Um, so I don't see any other questions in the chat. I do want to end with uh, with Brady actually telling us a little bit more about how Anchor is actually using Flux because it was kind of a nice surprise for us when we reached out and said, "Hey, we're using we're using Sift. You guys want to come on and and chat with our community about that?" And then uh, come to find out, you guys are using Flux as well. So um, yeah, love is mutual. Yeah, well, I will uh, I will share my screen um, so that you can speak to your slide if you um, if you are ready you can turn on your camera and unmute yourself and uh, kind of tell us a little bit about how Flux is um, is using Anchor. Yeah, hey everyone, I'm or, Brady Todd Hunter. I'm, Anchor is using Flux. Sorry. Yeah, Anchor is using <laughs> Flux. Flux is using Anchor too. It's, <laughs> exactly. It's a mutual relationship. Um, I'm I'm Brady Todd Hunter. I'm the tech lead of the DevOps group at Anchor. Um, and 
I just wanted to give you guys a quick rundown of how we use Flux, um, super quick. So we use Flux internally on two different clusters. Uh, we have a kind of production dog food cluster that's running Anchor Enterprise that we use internally to scan all of our software. And then we have an internal testing cluster that we use during development. Um, and both of those are managed using Flux and they both have their own GitOps repositories. So on both of those clusters, we have a couple different environments and everyone is set up just a little bit differently. Um, on our production cluster, we have Anchor Enterprise deployed using our production Helm chart, which is available on our um, Helm repository at charts.anchor.io. And it's using our production images from Docker Hub. And that's just a standard, what any of our customers would be running. Um, latest release, and it's used in all of our release pipelines for scanning our, our images. And then our more interesting cluster is our testing cluster. And that's got a bunch of different environments on it that are used for testing um, during the development cycle. We've got a, a nightly environment. We've got a sprint preview environment. We've got uh, our C candidate environments. And then we just have some like sandbox environments. Um, and all of those environments are configured slightly differently. We've got a couple of them using our production repo Helm repository and images, just like our production cluster. And then we have some of our testing environments are pointed to a Git repository that has all of our development Helm charts on it, and then a development image repository. And each of those are running slightly differently. So some of them might be running on branches of our Helm of our dev Helm repository. Um, and then a lot of them are using different image tags uh, based on how those images were created. So uh, on that, oh, and then the last one is we have a bunch of like kind of ad hoc um, different tools like monitoring, Prometheus, um, log collection. And a lot of that stuff is spun up using just like standard Kubernetes manifests. Um, still using Flux, but just raw Kubernetes manifest in the Flux GitOps repo. Um, all of those environments are managed using, or not, or not managed, they're managed using Flux. And the artifacts that are used are all, all have different pipelines, different normal CI CD pipelines and release pipelines. So for example, um, in every single one of our commits that go to any branch, we do, we build images, we tag them with like the Git SHA, push them up to our repository. And then our, our different environments are pulling those images automatically. Um, another key point of that pipeline is we also um, submit all of those images to Anchor Enterprise, our dog food cluster, the production cluster, um, to be scanned and cataloged. <clears throat> and then we also have release pipelines and all of those are managed through Git tags. So push a like Simver Git tag for our, our production releases. And that kicks off a release pipeline that builds a production image, which gets scanned in our, in our environment. And then um, automatically deployed to our production cluster. Um, we also have some release workflows for like preview and RC and, and all of those build different image tags, which are then pulled by Flux into our different environments. And the way that we manage that is through the image automation controller. And so in almost all of our testing environments, we have different regexes that are watching for specific tags. So in our preview environment, we'd be watching for preview tags in our RC environment, we're watching for our C tags. Um, in our nightly environment, we're watching for our nightly tags. And all of those just update automatically when the release happens, or like when those images get pushed to the repository. Um, and that, that kind of, that's kind of it for explaining like what our deployments look like and, and how we kind of manage our different environments at a high level. Um, and I just wanted to talk about the things that I love about Flex, because when Dan came and said, hey, are we using Flux? And I was like, oh, of course we are. I freaking love Flux. He, he said, can, can you come and just talk about it? So I just wanted to talk about the things that I really love about Flux. Um, so the, the biggest one, and, and I think this is what Flux uh, or what we, the folks at Weaveworks really push is the developer empowerment. This is something that is always a problem in the DevOps world is how do you give developers, like empower developers to be able to to make changes to their environments without having to have like a deep understanding of operations or a, um, escalated privileges to be able to, to modify things on the environment. And that this GitOps workflow really, really makes that super easy. Um, so we just have our GitOps 
Git repository that's for managing our different clusters. And we manage who can access those just using standard GitHub teams. Um, so you can create teams, however, whatever fits your organization, and you can delegate permissions to that repo to people using that without even having to give them access to your cluster, for example. And then they can just follow their standard development workflows by making changes to the deployments and putting in PRs, and then they can be reviewed and, and um, merged, and then they'll automatically get picked up by Flux and deployed to the environment. So I, I honestly don't feel like I've seen anything that empowers developers in such a good way. And it's been really easy to convince developers to just make changes to the, the environments as they need, which is super helpful for a testing environment. Um, the other thing I really love about Flux is the flexibility. So I talked about how we have a bunch of different environments and they're all deployed differently. I really like that I can you know, easily point my production environment to my production Helm repo and my production images. And then I can point all my testing environments to like branches on a Git repository or a separate image repository and use regexes to pull different images. It's just super flexible. Um, the other big thing I really like is that it creates a source of truth for my deployment. So I have a Git repository that tells me every single thing that's deployed to my to my environment. And then it also gives me kind of a, a change log of what that environment looks like through the Git history. And that is just, it's just so easy. Like, I don't know if any of you guys have gone into an environment you didn't know and tried to figure out how it's deployed. It can be a real pain. And this makes it super easy. Um, and then the last thing is it uses native Kubernetes mechanisms. So I'm an ops guy. I live in the terminal. I don't like using UIs if I don't have to. And I just really like that I can see everything about my deployments by doing like a cube control describe of a custom resource to see what's going on with that deployment. Um, I really, really like that. Um, and then finally, the biggest thing is it's just magic. Like everybody that I show it to or explain it to is like, oh my gosh, that's magic. And I say that all the time. It's just, it's just magic. It, you push things to a repo and it ends up on your cluster. And that's just so cool. That's awesome. And that, that's you. it for me. <laughs> Sweet. Awesome. Thank you. And Dan and Pinky, if you guys want to turn your cameras back on, I just want to say thanks. We are like one minute until the very end of our session here. So I'll just give everyone. So Winnie says loving the GitOps setup that Brady's talking about. So kudos. Thanks for sharing that so much. And thanks, Dan, for coming and showing us uh, really also all about our own projects and how we've set this up uh, <laughs> so that people can learn and and start playing around with Sift and Grip themselves as well. So um, you guys, I know, Dan, you're on the CNCF Slack. Brady, are you on CNCF Slack? How can people re reach you as well if uh, if they have questions or want to chat? I'm on the Anchor Community Slack. I should probably join the CNCF Slack too. So um, <laughs> no. always available on the Anchor Community Slack. I'm also on the Kubernetes Slack. Um, cool. So in all right. places. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for stopping by and sharing this wonderful presentation today. And um, yeah, we'll see you. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Brady. Thanks, Pinky. Thank Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye.